hear her anymore, but she can hear us. Ah, okay. Oh, that means we're live. I got the big thumbs up from Katie. So welcome to, uh, what month are we in? September. September. September right? 10th. September 10th. You're welcome to the September live. Joined tonight by Gary Wentz of the Family Handyman Magazine. So before we jump in, Gary, give us a little bit of bio and your background and uh, why you're here, what's going on. All right, so I began my construction career at a age 18 in North Dakota. So a couple, three years ago. More than 10, actually. Uh, uh, framing up potato houses in North Dakota. Wow. Enormous warehouses where potatoes are stored over the winter. Uh, continued doing construction work all through college. Um, did a lot of remodeling, did asbestos abatement. I was a journeyman plumber at one time. And uh, now I have an old house and a couple old rental properties, and uh, so I'm still learning. But you're in with the family handyman. If if you're not familiar, which I'm hard pressed to believe if you're not familiar, <laughs> but because the subscription base is huge, I mean, yeah, it's 1.2 million. And really, the family handyman is the magazine in the DIY home improvement industry. Um, so it's a thing. You know, one of the things. I don't know, kind of a line in the sand that we end up talking about editorially is we're, WWGOA, really all about woodworking, furniture making, cabinet making, mm -hmm. which is completely different than the home improvement yes. side of things. Yes. Well, we do some woodworking, but it tends to be lighter, you know, yeah. uh, not as advanced as what you're accustomed to. Um, and yeah, next year we're celebrating our 70th, 70th anniversary. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah. So the reason I wanted Gary to come, he's a friend of mine, so I wanted him to be here anyway. Um, but questions come in fairly often to me, and I just can't answer them, about plumbing, wiring, building a deck, installing a window, fixing a roof, whatever it is. So this is your opportunity, because now we have the expert on deck here, um, to, to bring those questions forward, and Gary will jump in wherever he yeah, wants to jump in. And don't sell yourself short either. I know you've done a lot of building. <laughs> Well, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very good framer. Um, I'm not much good at the rest of the stuff, but it's, and I, I shingled a roof probably, my last one was probably eight years ago at the conclusion of which I said, I will never shingle a roof again because <laughs> it was, it involves stripping the old off and putting yeah. a new one on. And, yeah. and it's, I mean, we could go on like this forever, but man, the technology has come so far from when I started in construction, like late seventies and we hand nailed every yes. roof yes, and now too. it's, uh, Everything is pneumatic and yeah. it goes so much faster. And yeah. So it's, I'm, doing, right. I'm doing a garage yeah. roof tomorrow. I'm, and, and, I am so and sorry I'm leaving saying. town. I can wait. <laughs> well, if there's maybe there's content there and we could end up with a video on it, we could make, we could, we could hand split cedar shingles. There you go. And there'd be a woodworking side of it and a roofing side. All right, let's jump in because I, there's never enough time to answer all the questions here. So, uh, Maybe this is from a Gary. So, uh, best way to treat glue squeeze out to prevent staining problems. You have any answers for that? So the method I use is to let it dry and scrape it off. I am I, so I, happy. I've, to hear that. I've done the water and sponge thing, and it's pretty good, but not foolproof. Yeah, I'm, and I'm with Gary on that. So the problem with wiping with a damp rag is you dilute water-based glue, you dilute the glue, and you just spread it around and um, you'll discover that when you go to put finish on, because the glue is effectively pre-finished that spot and your finish won't stick. So um, let it dry and scrape it. Or my other deal is to let it get rubbery and tight bond has some official word for this. I can't remember. It's, uh -huh. it's a state of something. Um, uh -huh. And at that rubbery stage, you can take a sharp putty yes. knife or chisel and yeah, slice it. I've done that as well. Okay. And if it's all the way dry, I use a carbide scraper. What do you use? A carbide scraper or a paint scraper, um, yeah. you know, a standard like off the shelf. Um, we've got an article about sharpening a paint scraper to put a burr on, on a grinder, ah, okay. to put a little better burr on it so it's a better scraper. Uh -huh. um, so it takes it, the downside is it's steel. It doesn't hold up against, glue is really hard stuff. So if it's just a steel scraper, it doesn't hold that burr very long, but it's a very easy process to kick it back up again on the grinder. Mm -hmm. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Best way to connect a tabletop or credenza top to the frame. 
glue screws or what so it does not crack or split the top. So this is that whole wood movement yes. thing. Yes. And a big lesson for people that not everybody understands when they get into woodworking is you can't stop wood from moving. Um, so products for this that you're familiar with? Uh, I like the, the figure eight connectors. I'm going to, I'm going to see if I can walk. Right. You keep, you keep talking because I All know right. right where they are. And, uh, but generally when I need one, I don't have them around. And... Oh, I'll send you home with some. <laughs> All right. And, uh, uh, usually then in a pinch, what I'll do is drill an oversized hole and, uh, leave the screws a little loose. So there's room for movement. Does that meet with your approval? Yes, sir. Um, so figure eight fastener. I'm going to, you, you be Vanna White. Okay. And I'm going to control it. So tonight, because there are two of us, we're mic'd a little bit differently. So I have a wire. I have a leash. So it makes the logistics a little harder. All right. With that figure eight, um, you Forstner bit drill a hole into the rail. There you go. And um, what actually happens is the table expands and contracts. The top expands and contracts as the whole thing pivots. So one part is screwed up into the tabletop, the other part is screwed down into the rail. Yep. And then the other one, I think maybe a little easier to install, these are just called tabletop fasteners or Z-clips. Um, and you just cut a kerf into the rail and the whole length of the rail, and then same deal, you screw that up into the tabletop um, and it allows the top, that, that whole gizmo slides back and forth in the kerf. Lovely. Can I buy a vowel? Oh, no, that's a different show. <laughs> Never mind. No, that is that show. Okay. Kind of caught up in my cord. So the big so, deal is let it move. No okay. glue. So generally, I don't have these things around. Because well, now I'm you have prepared. one of each. Okay. <laughs> so uh, my method of drilling an oversized hole, is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And it's... And, I've done that where um, punch a hole through the rail and then just walk the bit back and forth uh, in order to elongate the hole a little yeah. bit. Um, and it's um, anything that's going to allow that that solid wood to expand and contract. Mm -hmm. And, you know, here in our part of the world, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin, 80% um, humidity in the summer is pretty easy mm -hmm. to have happen. And 20% humidity in the winter when the furnace is running. So that can cause huge expansion and shrink of top. So um, compensating for that is crazy important. But yeah, the, the oversized hole is something, I mean, before woodworkers, when Duncan Fife was making furniture and didn't have this kind mm -hmm. of stuff, um, they'd use a bit and brace with an oversized hole and okay. go that way. Um, I love this topic. I see more and more people using CNC routers. Do you believe that technology takes away from the craft uh, in other words, do we rely too much on our tools rather than developing our own skills? So this doesn't have to be CNCs. This can be a laser on a job site. This could be, I don't know, there's all sorts of advances in technology. So where, where do you fall on, you know, is, is, is the work, is the craftsman making the tool or the tool making the craftsman? So I don't have any ideological uh problem with technology. If people want to use CNCs and, and make stuff, I think that's good for them. Personally, after a day in front of the computer, the last thing I want is to come home and work with- And do it at night in front of the computer. <laughs> right, on a CNC. Um, as far as other technologies, like on the job site, uh, laser levels and laser measuring tools are fantastic. Love them. So we, we could be out there shooting with a sextant. <laughs> But right. um, it right. sure makes it easier to do it with a laser. And I, here's my deal on this is I, I own five CNC's because I teach CNC classes here. Um, it's just another tool. And it's a, it's a router in a gantry. So you still have to understand how router bits cut, how wood gets machined, what's the right way, the right speed, the right feed. Um, you, the woodworker, still have to control all those parameters. So with... With CNCs, the question for me becomes, how far do you want to turn the clock back? Mm -hmm. So um, CNCs make that kind of woodworking easier. Table saws, I'm pointing to mine, make ripping and cross-cutting easier, but they didn't have them 150 years ago. Well, maybe they did. 200 years ago, they didn't have them. So 
do you, should you go back to a rip saw and a crosscut saw? Um, do you use a dovetail jig instead of cutting them by hand? So all of this stuff makes our woodworking easier. Um, and I don't think it takes away from the craft at all. Uh -huh. so. um, let me ask you this. Do you know, was there objection to electric power tools at one time among? Oh, more great purists? question. Yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. know either. But in our construction conversation, an interesting thing is my first foreman, so in late 70s, he was 50. When he started as a kid in construction, if you owned an electric circ saw, you paid your wage was twice. And I think it was a dollar an hour instead of 50 cents an hour as a carpenter if you owned your own electric circ saw. Huh. Huh. Well, uh, in preparation for our anniversary next year, I've been. Uh, looking at old issues of our magazine from the 1950s and it's amazing how expensive power tools were oh. so you know and i punched the numbers into a online yeah, relative, infla inflation yeah. calculator and it's things like a, a plain old drill that maybe wasn't even a reversing drill would cost 150 200 bucks right at a time when people were making Three grand a year. Well, I, I mean, in today's dollars. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Say $150, $200, $300 for a circular saw. Today you can buy something superior for maybe $75, $80, bucks, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's cool. Yeah, it's a good question of, I don't know if that philosophical question was around. Mm -hmm. right. We'd have to look at back issues of yes, magazines yes. to see was this, were people writing in about this? Right. Um, I have a 1934 oak top table that had an amateur, kindest word I can think of, <laughs> try to fix a split and part warp at a glue joint. Any idea to remedy? I think you got to cut it open and do it again. I mean, if, if it glued together and did something mm -hmm. like, if it bridged or something, mm -hmm. you're not, so it's kind of like wood movement. like. So so you're going to run it across the table saw, centering the blade right on the problem Right part. on the seam, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've had pretty good luck doing that. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the only way. You're not going to press it flat. I've tried that. Yeah. Yeah, how'd it go? <laughs> we don't want to talk okay. about it. Um, easiest way to determine grain growth, but I don't know what that means. Grain growth. Direction? Is it? I don't know. Let's see. That's uh, I don't. I don't have a name. Guest eighty two twenty three. If you can elucidate on your question a little bit, if you can explain for us what you're looking for there, uh, we'll see if we can help you out. Um, Joe on Facebook says, "I'm going to be refinishing my kitchen cabinets. I am so sorry for you. Um, going from mocha to a shade of white. Any tips? Have you done any articles on this kind of stuff? Uh, refinishing with paint." Well, it just or? says refinishing, and if they're mo I mean, going to a shade mm. of white, I'm assuming that means painting mm. over. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, you know, it's like any painting job. Of course, the prep work is eighty percent of it, and the key to a good job. So you're going to want to make sure it's clean, roughed up a little with at least what one eighty sandpaper. And it's like TSP. Is that still the thing? Trisodium um, phosphate you know, still the cleaner. I've for talked that? to a lot of pro painters lately who say they never use TSP. Wow. That there are other products you can go to any home center and pick up, uh, like a pre-paint cleaner, which is uh, it's essentially going to be something that cuts grease really well, right? Um, uh, and then I would, again, like I said, rough up the surface just a little so it'll hold paint. Um, and then for a really smooth finish, I would recommend getting a spray gun. And it doesn't have to be an expensive pro model. There are now, uh, from all the major manufacturers, have, have versions, airless sprayers that will spray latex pretty well. So airless, if you're not familiar with it, it's just, it's a standalone unit. It's just a gun. Mm -hmm. And when you plug it in electric, yeah. um, it, it'll make a kind of a high pitched vibrating sound, but that's the pump inside there. Yeah. Pumping the and thing. the pros have the big versions that are on wheels and you roll them around. But we've used, at the magazine, we've used ones that are a uh, hundred dollars or less. And they're a self-contained gun. And they work pretty well. And did, did you find that? So, of course, we're in somebody's kitchen. Um, yeah. 
So, I mean, is masking and plastic not, uh, not a boatload of overspray? Yeah, I, would, I, make... would, I would recommend taking the doors off and putting them outside. Okay. Um, How about the casework? Do well, you think they can spray uh, that? that's a little easier to brush or, okay. or roll. Because it's flat. Got it's it. flat, yeah. And, I, and in that world of rolling, I've had great luck with these foam rollers, not yes. the nap rollers. Yes. They're, and it'll specifically say on there, yes. for fine finish on cabinets and furniture. Yes. And yes. that, that is the way to go if you're going to roll out of paint. Absolutely. It's worth going to uh, maybe a home center, but maybe a paint store. Specialty store, yeah. And, uh, and paying whatever, four times as much for those little rollers. Yeah. It's well worth it. Yeah, I agree. Okay. Um, Ryan says, can an inter... Oh, this is a great question for you. Can an intermediate skilled DIY or handle installing crown molding or should they not even try? You can do We that. get asked about crown molding all the time and I say I'm... Is that right? Have you well, done, have you done just, much crown molding? Yes. Um, <laughs> and I'm, I'm okay at coping corners, mm -hmm. but my coping skills are not amazing. They're marginal. Mm -hmm. And I don't... It's not something I do every day. Right. So... Um, right. I've done enough to be dangerous and understand the process. But. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's, well, I, what do you think for Ryan? I, I think you can certainly do it. It's going to take you three or four times as long as it would take someone who's more experienced, but you can definitely do it. Um, the The big thing is getting your mind around the what we used to call the backwards upside down principle of setting it in the miter saw the crown is upside down. In other words, the part that goes against the ceiling is against the bed. Yeah. And uh, so that's, I, I think we've all done lots of times where we cut it the wrong way. But from there on, it's a matter of coping those joints and uh, taking your time to do it. Do it well. Buy a little extra. Buy some extra. If, it, if, it's, if you're painting or staining your finish, trim. Uh, well, then you can get away and, with murder. Well, yeah, right? paint a legend. Mm -hmm. Caulk will make you the, what, what's yeah, that phrase? Yeah. It's like caulk will make you the thing you aren't or so yeah. I don't know, whatever it is. But um, definitely have some extra pieces on hand because it's yeah. pretty easy to screw up yeah. a, a coped corner. Caulk and paint will make you what you ain't. There you go. I just there remembered you go. it. There you go. Yeah. And, and do you have an archive of articles? So like on any of this stuff, if there's a place where you might remember at some point, we did an article on installing crown molding. We've done several. And so where can people find fam, that stuff? Go to familyhandyman.com and use our search function there. Okay, there you go. Yep. Or Google Family Handyman, followed by whatever you're looking for. We, um, have, we have decades of archives on there. 70 years. Well, not 70, but <laughs> <laughs> lots. Um, nobody, nobody is scanning in the, the art of issue we're, we're, number we're one. Doing, yep. We're doing that a little, but uh, right now I think online we have uh, content going back to the early 90s. Oh, that's still, yeah. that's, that's a lot of data. Yeah. Um, best way to refinish painted cabinets, which I think we just hit on. Mm -hmm. You know, that's okay. All right. Best way to frame a basement wall, build on floor and raise or build standing in place. So tip up uh -huh. or uh -huh. uh, I would frame on floor and tip them up. And especially in a basement, I like to, since it's damp at best and sometimes actually wet, I like to make the wall say a little more than an inch and a half short and then push it up against the ceiling joists oh. and then slip uh, uh, treated sections of two by under there. And shims if needed. So are you so framing with just SPF initially? And that's, then yes. And then I'm putting spruce pine fir is SPF, just yep. white wood, not treated. Yep. And then that way treated wood is sitting on the floor. Cool. And it also prevents you from having the uh, frustrating problem of trying to tip that wall up and it won't fit. Because you made it perfect. <laughs> yeah. So what I, you know what I like about that is when I've done it where I'm framing in place, mm -hmm. you're you're kind of laboriously getting the top plate up there yes. fastened to the yes. ceiling, and then you're fastening your bottom plate. And then this stud is 102 and 5 eighths. This one is yes. 102 and 7 16 yes. This one yes. is, so if you build on the floor, tip up and add, yeah. it takes yeah. out that custom yeah. cutting. Stick in some shims where you're yeah. not quite exact. I like that yeah. idea. Okay, that's cool. Um, 
Best way to join boards to make a tabletop? Well, I'm gonna say jointer because I'm a power tool guy. Um, if my friend Paul was here, he might say you can use a hand plane. I can't use a hand plane for that. Have you ever found uh, that with a really good blade, you can uh, rip them on the table side? Yeah, so blade technology has come so far, um, so many advances, um, and companies are specifically making what they call glue line rip blades, and the cut quality is incredible. Um, so the only downside of that is I, I can get, from a blade, I can get smooth, mm -hmm. but can I get straight? Right. So if the edge that's against the fence is a little bit banana shaped and, and you're doing a six foot long tabletop right. and it just rides that banana, now you have an edge that's perpendicular to the face and smooth from the blade, but it's still it's, banana shaped. Yeah. And when you glue it to the adjacent board, you're not going to have a good glue joint. Okay. So the addition to that would be yes, but then you probably need a sled where you can clamp a kerfluey mm -hmm. board, a, a not straight board to the yep. sled, and the sled's going to travel in a straight line to give you that first perfectly straight edge. Mm -hmm. But yeah, the, a, a joiner would be the best choice, um, but it, it can be done on a table saw with the right blade and the right jig. And uh, now I don't own a jointer, uh, so another workaround I've done is uh, a straight edge and a router. Yeah. And that worked reasonably well. And even as long as you use the same straight edge all the time, like even the edge of a piece of plywood. Is, yeah. and, and if I do that on this edge and I do it on the mating edge and it's got a little bit of kerfluiness to it, but the kerfluiness will match between yes. the boards because yeah. I use the same straight edge for each one. Mm -hmm. The kerfluiness is a woodworking <laughs> term you might not be familiar with. I'll look it up later. I'm primarily a DIY kind of guy. I'm about to make a bigger purchase. Uh, either a DeWalt planer or DeWalt sliding miter saw. I mean, completely different functions. Yeah. Um, so it's a little hard to, it's, it's more about, well, what do you want to be when you grow up? You know, what, do you, what are you going to do next? Um, I, was, I had a, in my first shop that I built, um, I was actually without a planer for a long time. Um, well, I was actually thought of miter saw for a long time because I did all my cross cutting on the table saw. So mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe I just kind of answered the question. If you own a table yeah. saw, you, you can, can do your cross cutting you can there. Do great cross cuts, but you can't plane on a table saw. So I don't know. Yeah, if I were in this position, I would want a good miter saw before I would want a planer. Okay. That said, everyone I know who owns that Dewalt uh, planer. Loves it. That Dewalt 735 is amazing. It's a, yeah. that's a really, really good planer. Um, I'm an apprentice at a woodworking shop. Any tips for sharpening chisels? Any good book recommendations to read up on? Um, the WorkSharp system, you guys must have written that up a yeah. few times. Um, yeah. The WorkSharp system is amazing. And it, they've got a number of devices you can use with it. The, the big deal with chisels is getting the angle the same every time. It's usually either 25 degrees or 30 degrees. Um, so hitting that angle consistently is very easy to do with the jigs they provide with WorkSharp. Mm -hmm. And then if you do want to add a micro bevel on the end, there are also means by which you can do that. Um, what do you think of the glass and sandpaper method? I don't have the patience for it. Ah, okay. um, and Kentrick, it who writes for Woodworkers Guild is and has written for Family Handyman yeah. too. Um, he's the first one I saw do that um, self adhesive sandpaper on a plate of glass. Mm -hmm. And the, the premise is the glass is perfectly flat. You can lay down whatever grits you're looking at, you know, 200, 400, 500, 1000 in strips and just psh, 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 psh. part of part of my deal is, especially when I when my classes are active in here. I may be sharpening 30 chisels, not right. two. Right. Uh, I'm not going to do them by hand. Right. I, I, I just can't. But, it, but the premise makes sense. Yep. And uh, on the job site, uh, most of us would be carrying a, what we call a beater chisel. Yeah. And uh, you'd probably be horrified as, <laughs> you know, how we treated them, uh, including, you know, like chipping masonry with them. Opening paint cans. Yeah, everything. They were the universal tool. And then you sharpen it on the on first concrete pour. Well, or a belt sander. <laughs> that was our, our, sand, our sharpening system. Well, and that's, you know, for that, 
And I'm, I'm okay with that because I've got glue chisels in here that I mm -hmm. sharpen on a belt sander. Okay. Because I'm not asking much of them. Right. And same thing on a job site. Like right. when you're, you're looking to punch out the cutouts for lookouts on a fly rafter right. that we're not doing, we're not building a, a Duncan Fife piece of furniture right. here. So, um, if you seal your work with stain or polyurethane completely, does humidity still get in? So I think this is throwing back to the expansion yeah. contraction question. Okay. Now I've had uh, people I trust tell me that I don't have to do this, but I do it anyway. And that is I finish both sides of say a tabletop the yep. same. I agree with that. Okay. And it's, and no matter how you seal it, well, and I'll say with the exception of like, if you're going to coat the whole thing in epoxy, that might be different. But right. polyurethane, lacquer, shellac, the humidity that we're talking about that creates expansion and contraction effects, um, that's still going to happen. Yes. Even and and you do, it's like doors in a house, and, mm -hmm. and there'll be when you buy a wooden door, it'll say finish six sides, and it's the same with a tabletop. It's the same with a stick of wood. Is two edges, two ends, both faces should all get the same mm -hmm. finish. Uh, decking screws. I hear conflicting reports on outdoor decking screws, such as galvanized versus stainless steel. Surely galvanized screws will last a long time as stainless steel is very expensive. So I think they're looking here for, yeah. is it worth going to stainless? And, and outside of galvanized, I mean, there's a bazillion coatings, right? Yes. In addition to yes. galvanized. Yes. Um, so I'm a, I'm a world-class cheapskate. I do not part with a dollar easily, but I've kind of gone to stainless screws uh, just because the coatings, whether it's galvanized or some kind of plastic coating, you, you beat it up when you drive the screw in. And, Especially with an impact driver. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to recommend spending money, but... Uh, but your feeling is so because stainless is through and through. Right. The whole screw is stainless. Yes. That yeah. the, the whole word coating yeah. is the downfall of the coated screws. Yes. Yep. All right. So I love stainless screws. Uh, what about mineral spirits to clean those kitchen cabinets? I've done that. Um, I, I, but it's not as, I, I don't see any reason. The only reason I've done it is I didn't want to run to the store and buy a better, some, you know, a better <laughs> the right, option. The right solvent. <laughs> <laughs> right. Or it was midnight and I had to have this done tomorrow morning or something. Uh, yeah, you're, you're better off going. And I find mineral spirits leave stuff a little greasy. Yes. Um, and if yes. you're going to do a latex paint over that surface when you're done, I think you could have an adhesion. Yeah, I, I, I do. If I'm going to use mineral spirits, I do wipe it down even an hour later with a, something really dry. Yeah. And, and if you look at it in the light, sometimes you still see a bit of oily residue on there. And this is, I'm always dicey on finishing questions because I don't want to screw up somebody's project because I, I have some level of knowledge in this, but not a boatload. Um, and my out on a lot of this stuff is we talked earlier about home centers are great. Specialty stores like Hirschfields or Sherwin-Williams yeah. to go in there and say, here's what I'm doing. And, you know, are you going to pay, I don't know what, 10% more for right. a gallon of paint? Right. Maybe. But that person who's made a life out of yes. understanding paint is going to say, tell me what your cabinets look like now. Here's the cleaner. Here's the sandpaper. Yeah. Here's the top coat. Here's the perfect foam roller. Here's the sprayer. Here's the So that buying that level of expertise by paying a little bit more per gallon of paint, I think is worth it to, yes. so that your paint isn't flaking off a year later. Yep. I, I think that's great advice. I that's another place I'm willing to spend money is, uh, say, the, the specialized paint store. Yeah. Because I get great advice. Uh, hi, George and Gary. I purchased an old shopsmith. It's in need of refurbishing. I'm new to the whole thing and afraid of messing it up or getting it worse than it is. Do you have any recommendations on reading materials that could assist me learning the process of refurbishing such a wonderful tool? Um, there's a guy, if you're on Instagram, Mark, um, there's a guy on Instagram who calls himself growth rings. I don't have my phone, but I'm pretty sure it's growth rings. Um, he and I worked together at Shopsmith as it turns out, um, like decades ago. Um, but he does a lot of, he, everything he posts is in relate in relation to Shopsmith and he's got a YouTube channel 
I don't know if the YouTube channel is also called Growth Rings or not, but that would be a good resource. And honestly, I think if you, I think still today, there are so many Shopsmith owners out there. I think if you Google Shopsmith owner, Shopsmith forum, Shopsmith owners forum, um, you're going to find resources that will help you out. Okay, vinyl floor planks compared to composite planks and the floor prep for each. All right, so um, it was probably three years ago when I first used snap together vinyl floor planks. And uh, within 10 minutes into that job, I was in love. <laughs> it's, they're so easy to install, they're durable. I put them in my rentals uh, where they get they well, there's, some, there's a good testimony right yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, they get some abuse there, and uh, years later, they still look good. Um, in, I, I think one nice thing about them is my buildings are, are old, and the floors are far, far from perfect. Um, uh, the vinyl tends to conform yeah. after a while to little imperfections in the floor, uh, which means you don't have to skim coat them or something to flatten them out. Um, so where, with where, whereas the composites are, are a much stiffer material. Um, so that, so sometimes if you step on a hollow spot, you'll feel it. So, and, and if you're snapped together, maybe that could snap open them as a um, result. You think? I've, I've seen that, but I think that's pretty extreme. Okay. Uh, to make that happen. Um, also the, the composites are thicker, which means you have to have larger transitions with, you know, a, a, adjoining floors. So I love vinyl. I love All that right. stuff. And some of it looks really, really great. And on the prep side under each one, is that part, like forget the leveling part, mm -hmm. but just if I want to do one or the other, is it is either more labor um, intensive to get ready for? So, so I think in all the situations I've used it, I've put it directly over uh, a sheet vinyl floor, what people call linoleum. It's not true linoleum, but uh, sheet vinyl. And uh, that, that's a bit of a cushion in itself. Um, more recently, vinyl floor, lots of vinyl floors come with a cushion on the back already. Um, and you can buy a, a sheet of a roll of cushion that you put down over the floor. Okay. And that's the so, same. That's kind of a horse apiece composite yeah, versus. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, but I, I really think vinyl is a great way to go in flooring, especially if you're a little concerned about your skills. It's Really, does that just cut with a knife? I've never done vinyl, I've done laminate flooring, but never vinyl floor. Is it a utility knife? Thing? Uh, score and snap with you know, yeah, huh. hit it with a utility knife and then snap it. That's mostly what I've done. Um, a guy at work at the magazine recently discovered that a grinder with, uh, with a diamond wheel oh. was a great way to cut like inside corners. <laughs> so, huh. there's a did he get a tip? Did you pay for that tip? Yeah, he gets paid anyway. Oh, it's one of He's the others. Okay. Um, and then Katie has put up, if you're looking for Family Handyman, um, where Gary was talking about going there and searching for content. Um, so within the chat role, Katie has very kindly put up the link yes. there for Family Handyman. Thank you, Katie. Uh, more useful in general, upcut or downcut spiral bits. I own lots and lots and lots of spiral bits. Um, 90% of them are up cut and then 10% of them are down cut. It's, so down cut can, will give you a better top surface, um, but it's, I, I rarely use them. So. Why is that? Um, the, well, the big thing for me is an up cut looks just like a drill bit. So it's augering the waste out mm -hmm. as it creates waste. Yep. Um, so whether it's on my router table or a handheld router or the CNC, the fact that it's pulling the waste out of the cut is going to give me, my, then my dust collection can work. Where a down cut spiral tends okay. to pack it down in there. Right. And then I have to right. do more on the back end to clean that out. Um, so I've done a project or two where there's like a bird's eye maple veneer over some substrate and I'm about to, route it and put mm -hmm. an inlay in or something then i would intentionally choose a down cut okay for that but so i learned the hard way that the small diameter we're talking solid carbide here yep uh you gotta be don't drop them <laughs> you gotta be gentle with them yeah yeah you don't want to yeah pretty soon you have two bits neither yes, of which yes. is worth anything <laughs> so it's really it's when an eighty dollar three eighths mm -hmm. carbide bit falls on the floor oh, and, and breaks into like, it's yeah. a really bad day. Yeah. Um, total beginner been looking at a variety of beginner projects 
notice so many call for measurements like inch and seven eighths or 15 sixteenths. Why not just make it two inches or whatever, the full inch or half inch? Does an eighth or sixteenth of an inch really matter? Depends what you're doing, yeah, right? I mean, building. where I uh, where I begin my construction that I described Potato earlier, buildings. you could yeah. be a half inch off and it's fine. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, I try in my, when I'm, when I'm, creating a project for a class, you know, I, I try to get stuff where face frame pieces are two inches wide and 28 inches long. And just because I know that avoiding fractions makes life easier. But unfortunately, if you're going to do woodworking, at some point you're going to deal with fractions and you do run into scenarios where there's just no choice. But uh, um, I never get to 30 seconds, but 16th, you know, right. there, there's no choice but to go to 16th to get the fit you're yeah. trying to get. And with woodworking, I find that most of the time I'm not measuring. I'm, I'm sneaking up on the cut, right? Yeah. Cut, try it, shave off a little, try it again. Yeah, I'm do and I do much the same thing. Um, I do a lot of stuff by gauging, not by measuring. So it's just making parts to fit. Um, Keaton says, so he does his sandpaper. We were talking about sandpaper on glass. He sprays it with Super 77, yeah. which I think is a 3M adhesive, yep. and sticks it to his table saw. But I wonder if that, I wouldn't just wouldn't want a residue on my table saw. But yeah. it's a nice flat surface. Well, on the other downside, McKintrick always does it wet on glass. Yes. Which you wouldn't want to do on your table saw. But if that right. works for you. But uh, other things work. One guy I work with, uh, he uses melamine. Yeah. And it's... There's a there's a shop here in town where they do granite countertops, ah. and their granite offcuts are like my wood offcuts. I mean, I'd, I've been there to get pieces, and they have a sink. I, the biggest thing I think I got was a sink cutout that was like 18 by 32 mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. And my, when we used it for my kid's Eagle Scout project, he did a bee garden. Um, so we laid that whole thing on the CNC and engraved that for the village and what the garden was all about and stuff. Um, but anyway, they're they're throwing stuff like that out. So if you're looking for a dead flat surface, table saw, glass, mm -hmm. and don't they call it float glass? Isn't that the right word for mm -hmm. perfectly yep. flat glass? Granite. Um, or a piece of granite off cut yep. like that. Mm -hmm. um, the bandsaw inherited went kerflui <laughs> and need to replace it. What are the must haves on a bandsaw? I've not done any resawing, but would like to. Yeah. I I never had a break on a bandsaw until the saw I have now. I've got a Laguna 14BX. I will now never own a saw that, that doesn't right? have a break on Is it. Is that right? Oh, I don't man. think I've ever used one with a break. Oh, after, when we're done, you can try it. Okay. It's, it's very cool. Um, well, let's just uh, tether tether your cord, Gary, and we'll, right. do a, we'll do a little we'll, – we'll run a tool tonight. I think now we just made you a gaffer. I think this is what, <laughs> right. when you see gaffer in a movie credit. I think that's yeah, where they are. Good. All right. So there's the saw. And just walk around the operator side of it. Okay. And green for go. All right. And then when you want it to stop, the brake is just kind of right in front of your right toe. Okay. This? Yep. Okay. And step on it like you're stepping on the brake of a car. Okay. Oh, like you're oh, okay. Like, like you're, you're panic like stopping your car. Okay. Do it again with more gusto, please. All right. Just because it's cool. All right. So, in the world of brakes on bandsaws, there a bandsaw wheel is a big flywheel, and that thing would spin for I don't know, probably yeah. two or three minutes in the absence of a brake. So, um, as long as we're staring at the bandsaw. Do you want a, any bandsaw buying advice from you? Do you anything you can throw in here? Uh, a brand recommendation? Uh, I, or, either, or, or, or just uh, features to shop for. Um, guide bearings. My first bandsaw uh, had blocks rather than bearings, and it was a pain to set up, and it never stayed quite right, so most of the time my blade was doing this. Um, so, and he said he's interested in resawing, so bearings are good for resawing. Uh -huh, so that's good. Uh -huh. And then probably capacity if you yeah, want to resaw. Yeah, you'll never regret having too large a bandsaw. Yeah. This one will so, do 13 inches. And I'm like, those are bowl blanks laying on the table back there. Um, 
I pretty routinely mm -hmm. am up at 13 inches when I'm cutting bowl blanks. Um, mm -hmm. Good dust collection, because you do mm -hmm. make a lot of really fine dust on a bandsaw. Um, I don't know. Yeah. It's a pretty simple machine, actually. Yeah. All right. Yep. Let's see if we can undo ourselves. All right. I'm, I'm impressed that we successfully navigated the course. Yeah, no accidents. Uh, I have a digital bevel gauge. I know you put it on the table saw, or put it on the table, then zero it out, then attach it to the blade to see if it's straight. But most times the saw blade, most times the saw blade width barely turn, and of course screw things up. What's the best way to do this? So I think what we're talking about Is something like this. Let me see if this is a battery. Yeah. You want to be Vanna mm -hmm. again? Oh yes. Are you you're familiar with that thing? From yeah, I don't own one. Oh, I'm all caught up in my cord. All right. So the way they work, if you just sit on the bench, I'll right. snap so to you. This could be your uh, table saw top, right? And then You push set to zero it out? I think. Oh, yep. it's at zero? Yep. Okay. And then you're going to put it on the blade? There's magnets on the bottom of it. Okay, and then it's going to tell you precisely. So I think his complaint is, or his question is about, when it goes on the blade, maybe it's the weight of the device is causing the thing to spin ah. a little bit, which then throws off the angle. Um, if it's a contractor style saw and you can reach around the back and hold the belt mm -hmm. so the blade stays in place, that would help. Um, I would avoid touching the blade because you don't want to introduce any pressure right. to it that'll throw that thing right. off. They're fairly sensitive. Um, I don't have a better answer than that. Yeah, I'm a little surprised just the belt in general won't just hold it. Or yeah. I wonder maybe if it's a, like a direct drive um, tabletop saw, bench top saw, then it doesn't have yeah, a belt on mm -hmm. it. So maybe it would be more prone mm -hmm. to rolling back yeah. and forth. So um, what about putting, what about putting a little piece of like a shim between a tooth and the table so that as ah, it tries yeah. to roll forward, it's going to act like a paw yes. and just kind of hold it. Yes, without knocking it off. Yeah, well, you're, and you're not touching it. It's just resting yeah. against Yep. The tooth is resting against that. I have a 12 inch sliding compound saw with a thin curved blade. I made sure everything is level and true with the saw blade, fence, and so on. When I make a straight cut, it always seems to cut a little different. One time it'll cut exactly straight. The next cut is not a straight cut. Sometimes it even cuts with a bow. So my take on uh, sliders is that you're always going to have a little play in there. Yeah, it's, it sounds to me like if you're getting these different reactions, it could be that the saw is walking. You know, if it's on rails, mm -hmm. that the head of the saw is walking a little. Um, one of the things that is really important um, when you're making a cut is, is to cut on both sides. And it's, you know, we were just talking about sneaking up on final size. And when you're doing that, you're going to be skinning end grain, skinning end grain. As a rule, I find you want to avoid that when you can, especially in hardwoods. Because um, when you're only cutting on one side of the blade, that can cause the blade to yes. deflect. Yes. So on your cuts, um, Brian, I would, like one test would be make sure that you got wood on both sides and you're, that's going to facilitate getting mm -hmm. a straight cut. Um, if even with that, it's a bow one time and straight one time and something else another time, it sounds to me like the mechanism of the saw. Um, I've seen on some where um, the bushings on those rails can be snugged yes. up a little bit. Yes. And I would check if your saw is capable of doing that 
and take some play out of it. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, I wonder if it happens more when the saw bogs down or anything. I mean, being yeah. at being at full RPM and not bogging down the saw yeah. will give you a much. Well, on sharp blade, you know, if the blade is dull, that can make it want to wander um, mm-hmm. instead of following the path you're trying to set it on. So check the blade. Um, see if you can snug up the bushings on the guide rails, um, and then try whenever you can to cut with stock material on both sides of the blade, not just one side. With a router, is it wise to have multiple size routers, a small rigid and a large porter cable, or a router that can do it all? Well, you work for rigid and I work for porter cable, so we (laughs) should say more, more, more. No, I don't yeah. know. I mean, I, I I bet I have at least a dozen routers, and sometimes I don't have the one I wish I had. Yeah. I will say this though: that since I got uh, a little trim router, I probably use it for eighty percent of what I do. Did you get a battery one or a cord? I did. I no, and I in fact, I've only used a battery one once, and I really liked it, but I don't know if I'd like it all the time. What's oh. your take? I so. First part of the question, um, being able to change routers instead of changing bits is a wonderful first world problem to have. (laughs) Um, And I do own, I own fewer routers than I did. At one point I did a big purge in here and I think I sold 10 routers and I still had eight. Um, Mm -hmm. It was just accumulation over time. Um, But now I I have a couple of trim routers, um, one's corded, one's battery. Um, I've got a rigid battery trim router. I use that all the time. Mm-hmm. That not having the cord trail yeah. around me is a wonderful yeah. thing. And then something in a horse and a half or two horse category. Because yeah. yeah. um, the trim part of the limitation with a trim router automatically is they only take quarter inch shank bits. Yep. And you want to, when you go to a bigger cutter, an OG or round over, something like that, you want to go to a half inch shank so you have less chatter on the cut. And the trim router will never let you do that. So, and then we can throw in there, you're going to probably run into a scenario where you want to plunge um, because you have a distinct starting point and stopping point. And it's only Mm -hmm. with a plunge router that you can do that. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's nice to have multiples. Uh, This is addressed to you. Hi masters. (laughs) Um, Is there a book you can recommend for starting with my wood lathe or a beginner project beyond cups? Well, we have, um, hey, Katie, if you could do on GOA, just do a search for lathe and then put that link in the comments. Um, We have a boatload of content on turning because I'm a very avid, or it's probably wood turning, Katie is what it really is. Um, I'm a very avid turner and we have got a lot, a lot, a lot of videos on the site for that, including projects and stuff. Have you done lathe work? Uh, Only once. Well, so in, it's ironic that we're talking about a lathe story because my very first writing job ever was for Family Handyman when, what was the other magazine? It was called Woodwork or something. Oh, we, uh, uh, Home Woodworker. Yeah, so this is like 1997, 98. Uh-huh. And I did an article for that magazine that was turned toward the holidays and it was all about turning Christmas ornaments mm-hmm. on a wood mm-hmm. lathe. I remember so it. Yeah. It would be fun to find a copy of that <laughs> I horrible <did> that. <laughs> article. Um, Radke, David Radke was my like supervising uh-huh. editor on that. Uh-huh. Um, that. So if that was 1998, what is that, 20? No, yeah. 32 years ago? Is, no. 98, so 22 years. 22 years ago. It's been Still a, a long time. Uh Best method for getting rid of snipe on a planer. Methods I've tried are not successful. Well, I mean, there's a bunch of common things here. Chase one board with another Mm -hmm. so that um, while you can lead with a board, then you have your target board, then you chase it with another scrap. So the snipe is happening on the scrap. Good support on the outside, on the outfeed side. Yep, making sure your infeed and outfeed tables are flat, um, are dead flat. And I'm assuming we're on a benchtop planer. If it's a big mm-hmm. stationary planer, the snipe is usually a result of uh, down pressure on the infeed and outfeed rollers not being correct. That's not an adjustment you can make to benchtop planers. Um, but I don't know. Those are the common solutions. Are um, 
waste boards and making sure you're dead level yeah. on your tables. Yeah. And in my own case, it's I, I just assume it's going to happen, and it's it's something I live with. So I start with boards that are a couple split, inches, yeah, four yeah. inches longer, maybe. I'm tearing out an old driveway and putting in a new concrete driveway and retaining wall. Which one first, block on top or next to the driveway? So I think is the question yeah. is once the concrete's in, could he frame stack? Is retaining wall on top of that concrete driveway. Um, I would, in most cases, I would not set that. Yeah, that right seems on the a little funky. Yeah, it would go next to the driveway. Um, I don't know how big or heavy the wall is going to be, but your driveway is not meant to take that kind yeah, of. Yeah, it's load. not a. It, there's no frost footing under the driveway. Right. I have an old delta jointer, and the outfeed side got pitted when the unit was in storage. How do I refinish as the pitting scratches the wood? If it's pitting, you take it to a machine shop and they got to surface grind it. Um, you're not, so pitting being actual holes in the cast iron surface, um, that's not a thing you can take out in your shop and keep it flat. I mean, do not take a sander to it because you rely on the infeed and outfeed tables on a joiner to be perfectly straight. And if you start messing with that by hand, um, you're going to, you're going to lose that flatness. I have a Graco Finish Pro Toolbox 9.5. Do you know what that I is? I don't. Uh, the but problem I, I face is the gun is in poor shape. What's a good replacement? Could I get a rebuild kit? And the 3M PPS system. So the 3M PPS system, I love that. That's just disposable buckets that go into your spray gun so you never clean the canister of a gun. So yes to that. Um, but I don't, neither of us is familiar yeah, with the Yeah, I'm not Graco. familiar with that gun. I have a small utility trailer I want to build a, a removable roof for. There'd be an interesting handyman project. Yes, yes. Um, I built the sides from plywood and two by four supports that stake into pockets in the steel frame. Any suggestions on how to construct the roof structure so it can hold up well in the winter with snow and ice and I'm guessing an aspect of that too is you're going to pull this down the road. Yeah. So it's got to have some shingles are probably not a good choice. <laughs> right. um, I want to attach the roof to the sides with strips bolted to the tops of the sides. Would you recommend a excuse me a vaulted design or maybe I think this should be gabled design mm -hmm. with a fairly steep pitch? The trailer is four by eight. Hmm. That's a, what an interesting project. Um, yeah. Vaulted design. I, I don't quite know. I don't, what yeah, I don't, I would, table. for the sake of simplicity, I would probably lean toward like a shed style roof. So it's just, so it's high on one side, low mm -hmm. on the other. Mm -hmm. And I guess it depends like how waterproof are you fixing for this thing to right. be? Um, because on the high side, it's a little more open, a little more prone to getting water in there. Yep. And then maybe that fiberglass sheathing yeah, for the roof. Fiberglass or metal. Um, fiberglass would be a little lighter, assuming you're going to yep. lift this thing on and off. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and that's good stuff. Yeah. Inexpensive and widely available. I mean, and it, it just to do. A peaked roof. Yeah, I seems like not, a lot of work for a trailer. Yeah, and you're going to add weight because you need more framing under there. And yeah, a shed roof is like the way to go. Possibly high in back and lower in the front. I have a 14 inch bandsaw with a step pulley on the motor. What should I be running it for? What speed should I be running it for? What type of wood? So once you find it for wood, you can just stay there. And I got to think a second. It's like. Cutting metal is about 750 feet per minute on a bandsaw blade. I think wood is around 2,000 feet per minute. Um, so now we'd have to figure out, or you'd have to figure out, um, how to translate diameter of pulley to surface feet per minute on the blade. Because I don't know what RPM that would be. Mm -hmm. It depends on the bandsaw. Yeah, you're um, beyond my expertise yeah. here. So here's what I would do. I would Google, Joe, I would Google um, 
I would Google blade bandsaw blade speed for wood cutting. That's going to give you, it'll probably say um, SFPM, surface speed, speed per minute. And that's just literally how fast is the blade zinging past your table. Um, and then once you know that, um, based on the RPM of the motor, when you, when you look at pulleys, it's just a ratio. So if this pulley is two and this pulley is four, then it's going to go, it changes it by two times or half, depending on which is which. Um, so once you know that, that might help you then figure out which pulley you should be on. But wood is generally fast, metal is slow. Meat cutting is somewhere in between. If you're butchering a deer on there, it's a whole different thing. Oh, geez, it's almost eight o'clock. Uh, new workshop, French cleats or pegboard? Uh, pegboard for everything small, uh, French cleats for heavy stuff. Okay. I love pegboard. Um, I have a new set of two cherries. I think that's a chisel brand. They appear to have a coating on the blades. How do I remove the coating? Uh, there I would use mineral spirits. You know, it's, I'm guessing they got shipped with some, some kind, kind of, of heavy oil. So they wouldn't rust. Stuff. Yeah. Yep. Um, John says, do you ever scroll saw? No. Um, I, I own one, but it rarely gets used. I have one that's probably got an inch of dust on it. Yeah, mine is uh, the the chisels from my hollow chisel mortiser are being stored on my scroll saw table. <laughs> Gary, what's the biggest? Oh, this is great. Maybe a good <laughs> final question. Right. The biggest safety mistake weekend warriors make. Um, please save us all a trip to the emergency okay. room. Okay. This, um, this is from Paul. Uh, you, you know what? Uh, with with saws in general, people worry about cutting off fingers. I've had my very worst accidents on the, on the table saw uh, with kickbacks. Um, that's that's my take on it. Okay. Uh, that I, I mean, I have scars <laughs> from kickbacks, and that's something I think it's something I think beginners and DIYers don't think about. And I think so. There's probably an, a couple factors there. One is awareness of what the table saw is yeah. capable of. And another is, I think at a beginning level, we tend to buy our material. I'm going to, I'm just going to make this out of one by four pine from the home center or two mm -hmm. by four pine or whatever. And that stuff isn't dried the way the lumber I'm going to build furniture out of is. Yep. It's, it's often case hardened and that's what makes it pinch, pinch or open as it gets past yep. the blade. So, you know, one, I'm not that used to using the saw. Two, I'm buying material. It probably shouldn't be getting ripped on a table saw because of its mm -hmm. internal pressure. Yep. Um, and all of that comes together and yep. you have a bad kickback. Yeah. And then the other thing is hearing protection. I think it's maybe uh, the most neglected form of, what? <laughs> well, at the magazine uh, during meetings, all uh, we old carpenters are often sitting there going, what'd you say? Yeah. I'm, I'm not kidding. It's, it's serious. Yeah. And it's a thing um, because it's cumulative. Yes. Um, it's easy to think I'm only making a cut, right. so I'm not going to bother with my earplugs or my earmuffs, um, but one cut and then another, and then, you know, cumulatively one today, one tomorrow, one the next week. Yep. Um, and all of that is, is having a negative effect. Most, most tools in a woodworking shop run around a hundred decibels and you got to get below 80. Five, I've seen I think, 85 and then I've seen even stricter 70 even. to be safe. So uh, you want, you're looking for hearing protection. That's 20 to 30 decibels of cutout. Um, we have one minute. Uh, your preference on screw head types, Phillips, square, Torx. Uh, Torx are fantastic, but uh, I, I square drive is my favorite because the number two size is like 99% of them are number two. Yeah, it is. I like the Torx from the ability to retain the tip. Yes. If yes. I can find that tip in my drawer. Right. right. So where the, right. where, yeah. And then riddle me this, Batman, before we leave, since we're talking about mm -hmm. screws. Why do they even make slotted screws anymore? <laughs> I don't know. What's, what, what, who, 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 yeah. who would choose to do? You know, here the only the only bone I can throw them mm -hmm. is if you're doing some kind of antique reproduction, 
you know, and you want a yeah, square headed yeah, yeah. nail yeah. and this old looking solid screw, slotted screw. But outside of that, like, I can't believe you can walk into Home Depot and yeah. buy a bubble pack of slotted Ooh. screws. Like, who wants that? You don't know yeah, either? I can't think okay. of a good reason. I okay. was, was going to try to argue with you, but I can't. Okay. Um, well, any any other uh, wisdom words? Words to wisdom? Did you have fun? Was this cool? This did was it, fun. Did it feel like an yeah. hour? No, it went really fast. Good. Really fast. Can I can I get you to come back again? Absolutely. And do this by yourself, so I don't have to be here. <laughs> nah, that's something to promise the audience. <laughs> well, this, I I I am so happy that Gary's here. And, you know, and it's 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 a cool thing. I'll try to not cry. Um, but it's I mean we've known each other decades. Yes. And it's a neat thing that like you make these contacts at some point in your life without knowing that a quarter century later, we're still doing stuff yeah. together on a pretty regular yeah. basis. And it's yeah. just, I have a lot of uh, respect for Gary's skill set as a, as a magazine editor and also in the construction and DIY world. Um, he's got a lot of really cool stuff going on. Thank so. you, George. All right. Katie, you can sign us out and we will say a fond farewell. Good night, everyone. <laughs>